بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم نحمده ونصلي على رسوله الكريم أما بعد فنعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وقال الله تعالى في القرآن الكريم اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صدق الله عليه وسلم So we begin with praise and gratitude to Allah and we seek blessings upon the Prophet peace be upon him and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states guide us to the straight path Okay, the goal for uh, the goal for today is to do a high-speed review of everything that we've covered over the past two months. It's, uh, and then we will we will recap, and we will also for those who are watching online, we also have to do our raffle for the iPad giveaway. <coughs> the iPad was here. It's walking around. Are uh, these participants are? Um Entitled to fill in the form and yeah, yeah. In the yeah. 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 Okay. Uh, if uh, if anyone here would like to be part of the raffle and you've not filled out the form, then we'll have to give you yeah. some uh, uh, form. It's a, it's a raffle for a free iPad. Yeah. yeah. So it's not the no, iPad. And just to add on to that, this basically is we are uh, looking forward building our database for our e-newsletter and reviving our book club. So inshallah, so we will be using that, but however, this is an incentive for people signing up for that free e-newsletter, news about, about ICRA, like this course that we are conducting, and many other activities that are happening, inshallah, you will be posted. And then, um, you know, and the book club revival, and we will send you more information about that, inshallah. Absolutely. Okay, so in the course of the course, we covered Al-Fatiha, in the first 39 ayahs of Al-Baqarah. And Al-Fatiha, as you and I know, is the whole flashlight through which to look at the whole Qur'an. It's the flashlight through which we look at the Qur'an, to understand the Qur'an. And think about this, even when we are in Salah, when we're in Salah, when we're in Namaz, we recite Al-Fatiha, and then we recite a few ayahs after that. Part of the idea here is you are understanding those ayahs that you're reciting in the light of Al-Fatiha that Al-Fatiha, even the ayahs that seem to be very, very frightening, we are understanding them through Al-Fatiha, and a central message of Al-Fatiha in our discussion was the idea of Alhamdulillah, praise and gratitude are due to Allah, praise and gratitude, often this is only translated as praise, this is praise and gratitude. Now, the question that I raised at the very beginning of our class some seven weeks ago was, can someone have a connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Can someone have a connection with God without the Qur'an? And we said that the answer was yes. You can have a connection with Allah without, without, without the Qur'an. You can have a connection with Allah without Islam. You can have a connection with Allah without religion. And we have a few examples of this in the Qur'an itself. One is Luqman alayhi salam. This is in Surah 31, Quran ayah 12 to 19. Surah 31, ayah 12 to 19, Surah Luqman. Luqman alayhi salam, not only did he have a relationship with Allah, he didn't, he, was, uh, he didn't have any connection with believers, he did not receive revelation, but he had a connection with Allah, he even had an understanding of the Day of Judgment, and he even understood Salah. So not only can you develop a connection with Allah without the Qur'an, without Islam, without religion, you can even develop Salah, you can even understand the Day of Judgment. So the natural question is, if you can do all of this without the Qur'an, then why do you need the Qur'an? And part of the point is that the Qur'an is there to give us the appropriate relationship with Allah. Because the common problem is that someone might have a connection with Allah, but it's not a complete relationship, or it's a problem, or there's a problem in the relationship. And I made the point that very often when I ask Muslims even, when you think of Allah, what is the first attribute of Allah that you think of? It should be mercy. When we think of Allah, the first thing you think of should be Rahman or Rahim. But some people, especially young people, will say anger. Because that's what they're being taught. They're being taught when they think of Allah to think of Allah as anger. And that's a very serious, serious problem. On the flip side, I had a student, uh, he might even be watching online, I had a student who, mm -hmm. who was raised Jewish and he, was, uh, and he became Muslim because he was being raised to understand Allah as wrath, to understand God as wrath. And then when he opened up the Qur'an, he saw mercy, 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 mercy. And because of that, uh, he, became, he became Muslim. So yes, you can have a relationship with Allah without the Qur'an, but the function of the Qur'an is to give you an appropriate, a healthy 
relationship with, with Allah. So. And so we begin uh, in the name of Allah, Bismillah, Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim. And we said that Alhamdulillah translates as praise and gratitude to Allah. Rabbil Alameen translates as what? It translates in our, in our books often as Lord, but more accurately, the one who takes you from immaturity to maturity according to your unique design. Immaturity to maturity according to your unique design. And what is part of the point for us to understand? Because we already understand this, but that Allah has an intimate relationship with everything. He is intimately involved with everything. And again, uh, if you've been Muslim even for even a little amount of time, you already understand this. A lot of people in our society don't. That Allah is involved with everything. Even the movement of every single molecule, the movement of every single, of every single hair or every single blade of grass. And He is nurturing every, every single moment. Right? Just like a, very much like a parent. In fact, the word Rabb, Rabbayani Salira, this is a this is an attribute that we also use in, in relationship with Allah or with uh, with our uh, when we speak about our parents. And then we see that Ar Rahman and Ar Rahim, mercy is mentioned four times. We say Bismillah Ar Rahman Ar Rahim, Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen, and then again Ar Rahman Ar Rahim. And so the question is that if Allah is so merciful that his mercy is mentioned four times, and what does the mercy mean? Uh, uh, one meaning of the mercy of Ar-Rahman is he is the highest in mercy. What is Ar-Rahim? He is the eternal in mercy. If he is so merciful, then how do we have suffering? And we said that's part of the design. That it is a promise that every single person will, will be hit with some sort of suffering. That's a promise, that's a guarantee. But you will not be hit with any suffering you cannot handle. Okay? Allah does not give us a burden we cannot bear. This is a promise at the very end of Surah Al-Baqarah. This is in Ayah 285 and 286. But what else do we know? That this world is also not fair unless you include the Day of Judgment. Because I gave the example at the beginning of the Course, what do you, how do you explain mercy when we speak of a baby that's born addicted to drugs? Right? The baby didn't do anything. The mother did something. Yet the baby is the one who is suffering. And suppose the baby lives for a year, maybe two years of constant, constant pain, constant suffering, and then the baby dies. From the perspective of dunya, okay, that's not fair at all. Okay? That's not fair. Right? Just like we might have some people who are good people, and then Hurricane Katrina comes and it wipes out their whole life. Okay? Or a tsunami comes and it wipes them out. Or an earthquake, earthquake comes and it wipes them out. Or, like what we're seeing in the Middle East, we have all these societies where people are being exploited by the leader, but they didn't do anything wrong. And part of the point here is that if you do not include the Day of Judgment, then this world is not fair. Because on the Day of Judgment, everything is made fair. That each and every one of us, at the bare minimum, we will see on the Day of Judgment that justice is being served. And this, we all understand this, but the point is to really, really think about this. Because when something wrong happens to us, keep in mind that on the Day of Judgment, that person is going to have to pay. If we do wrong to someone else on the Day of Judgment, we're going to have to pay for it unless we seek forgiveness or unless we, unless we perform. But the point again is that this world in terms of morality is not fair unless you include the Day of Judgment. And this brings us to the middle of Al-Fatiha. We say to Allah, إِيَّاكَ نَعْبُدُوا وَإِيَّاكَ نَسْتَعِينَ You alone we worship, you alone we ask for help. And this word worship, the question is what do we mean by worship? Worship, what do we usually mean in our society? You pray in a particular way, you have some rituals that you go through for whatever it is or whoever it is that you worship. You're hoping for some reward or you're hoping to avoid some punishment. Worship in, in terms of ibadah, abd, as in abdullah, what is it? It is the most extreme form of love. That when you love your object of love, when you love your beloved, what do you do? You value your beloved. You value what your beloved values. You hope that the beloved will return the love. You fear that the beloved will not return the love. What else? You might even change yourself to become like what your beloved wants. You hope to be in the company of your beloved. This is love. Okay. Deeper than love is to adore. And when you adore, you're putting the beloved above you on a pedestal, so to speak. But then deeper than that is worship. And what do you do when you worship? You surrender completely. And so when we are saying to Allah, 
that you alone we worship, we are saying that you alone do we give this most extreme form of love. We surrender ourselves completely to you. We enslave ourselves completely to you, voluntarily, lovingly. Okay? Complete, complete surrender. Now, keep in mind that the way that the grammar works, we are saying to Allah, you alone we do worship. You alone we will worship. We do not worship anyone else. We will not worship anyone else. Iyakanabudu. Four meanings right there from the start. Okay. In, so you alone we do worship. You alone we will worship. We do not worship anyone else. We will not worship anyone else. Okay. All of us simultaneously. Okay. Now when I am saying Iyakanabudu, on the one hand I am making a commitment to Allah. I am making a pact to Allah that this is what I am, this is what I am going to do. I am also expressing a goal, that my goal is to reach this level. It may be that many of us are at different levels. Okay? We're all at different levels. And every time we recite another 5 p.m., we're saying this is the goal that we are trying to reach. So, we are making this pact, and this is also the goal. Now, you alone, we ask for help. Okay? Same point. You alone, we do ask for help. You alone, we will ask for help. We do not ask for help from anyone else. We will not ask for help from anyone else. Okay? But here's the question. If I have a flat tire and I call AAA, okay, because I'm too, you know, I don't want to fix my flat tire myself, um, uh, am I asking for help? Am I contradicting here? Am I contradicting this line? No. Okay, no. And part of the point is that we want to have the understanding that the help is still coming from Allah. Okay? That we are praying to Allah that Allah is helping us through this person, through this AAA person. Just like when I'm taking medication, I'm sick and I take and I take this pill, this tablet. Okay? My prayer to Allah is that this tablet is, gives me the cure that I need. Mm -hmm. That you are still directing the help, or you're still understanding that the help mm -hmm. is coming from Allah. And then we say, <laughs> guide us to the straight path. And what did we say first about this idea of path? That our tradition uses the word path. Again and again, sharia is path, path that leads to relief, path that leads to water. Tariqa is path, path that removes obstacles out of the way. Right? Even uh, madhab, when we speak of the schools of law, this is the direction that you're, that you're going. Sira, when we speak of the biography of the Prophet, peace be upon him, this is, this is the walk that someone has done. Uh, even when we get into the technical subjects, like uh, in, in Maliki Fiqh, we have the word Muatta, which is one of the, uh, the central texts of Maliki Fiqh which is the path that many people have walked. Okay. And part of the point is that this is how our tradition works. We speak of everything, or we tend to speak of most everything, as a path. But I was going to say, Sharia is only the way to, it's only the, the road to lead it to our goal. Okay. It's not the goal. Sharia is not the goal, correct. This it is important. Sure Sharia so is the way to the goal. There are only one way to, to get to the goal, or there are quite a few It's a very, very wide way, right. let's put it that way. Yeah, yeah. So, the one way, in a way, but it's a very, very wide, right. wide path. Some people want to speak of it as a very narrow yeah, path. We speak of it as a very, very wide path. Yeah, very, very important point. And think of Islamic law also as a process. Uh, very rarely can you give a definitive answer. This is the answer for all times. Uh, Islamic law says that uh, there's two things that are always changing, Makan and Zaman, so your location and your time. Which means my answer today for Skokie in the year 2011 might be different than my answer for, let's say, you know, uh, Hyderabad in the year 2020, even for the same question because it's a different location, different time. But yeah, it's a process leading to the path, uh, leading to the goal. Now what else? When we have a path, we have a destination. Okay. What is the goal uh, of, uh, of our life? When we say guide us to the straight path, what is the goal or the end point of the path? So success, and what would that success be? Uh, uh, you know, and or the pleasure of Allah or the company of Allah. For some of us, that is Jannah. Right? For some of us, the goal is to be with Allah. Sometimes our goal is the palace of Jannah or the rivers of Jannah, so forth and so on. I was just wondering, but then it is different than Panafilallah. I'm sorry? You know that when we say Panafilallah, uh -huh. you know, with like the big, uh, you like know, Panafilallah and Adma become one, I'm just talking about that, you know, philosophy. Some, you know, some of that is, is more related to dunya. Okay. Right. Meaning that you reach the point in dunya where you have where you have no identity, mm. no consciousness, just Allah. Yes, and the difference between this dunya and the akhirah is that the final veil is gone. Mm. 
It's not that I die and I become one with Allah. No. That's a that's a very, very controversial yeah, subject. Okay. That would require a whole yeah, second that, course. That would be yeah. Yeah. That the word yeah. would be yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, there's there's two very important concepts here. One is wahdat al wujud, which is what this is speaking about, uh, the unity of existence, the oneness. Yeah. Uh, Shah Waliullah changed it to wahdat al shuhud, so yeah. which is the oneness of witness, which yeah. is probably easier to to, to understand yeah. that you you see nothing but Allah. But, yeah, that's, that's a more more uh, more acceptable. So, there's the destination, and if we have a straight path, what else do we know? There's also a crooked path, right? The straight path is the most direct path. The crooked path may or may not take you to your goal, and it may take a longer time. So, some very, very simple points, but the idea is that our life, our Islam, our deen is a path. And why am I emphasizing this point? Because often, whether or not we realize it, often we reduce our Islam to all or nothing. Okay? You have to do this, 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 you have to do this. If you don't, you're a failure, yeah. right? That is not our deen. Mm -hmm. Our deen is, okay, you're on this step, now what do you need to do to get to this step? Now what do you need to do to get to this step? Mm -hmm. So uh, Ramadan is beginning. We have one person who prays all the prayers in the mosque, who at night does all of the tarawih prayers in the mosque, okay, and smiles all day long. Okay. We have another person who might fast one time in Ramadan. Maybe he makes it to the masjid one time. Okay. okay, we don't say this person is fantastic, that other person is a failure. No. For the first person, what can the first person who does all the fasts, all the prayers, everything, what can that person do to improve? Because everybody has space to improve. And likewise, for the person who only makes one fast, what can that person do to improve? Again, we are all at different levels on a ladder or on the stairway. And so the goal is to figure out what step, what level am I at, and then how do I get to the next step. Because what, what did the Prophet teach us, peace be upon him? He was asked, what is the best of actions? He says, the one that you do consistently, even if it is small. That one hadith affected my life tremendously. You go for a consistent behavior, even if it's small. So if you're someone who's, who hasn't fasted, maybe you've been Muslim your whole life and you're 50 years old and you've never fasted, so then may you make it your goal that maybe in this Ramadan I will do one fast. Or I'll do five fasts. The point is that you keep improving, step by step by step. Our deen is not all or nothing, where you do everything and if you don't, you're a big failure. Okay, then we define this path, the path of those whom you have favored, not the path of those on whom is anger, nor of those who are astray. And a key point here is that when we speak of the favors of Allah, we already agree that everybody has received favors from Allah. There's nobody who has not received favors from Allah. The Pharaoh received favors from Allah. Okay? Uh, all of our neighbors, whether we know them or do not know them, whether they're Muslim or not Muslim, everybody has received favors from Allah. Okay? Every blade of grass has received favors from Allah. So when I ask Allah, guide me to the straight path, the path of those whom you have favored, what am I really asking? I'm asking, guide me to see my life as favors. Okay? Guide me to understand and appreciate the favors of my life. Okay? And if I do that, then what is my response? My response will be, Alhamdulillah. If I see my, my life as favors, then my natural response will be, Alhamdulillah. Praise and thanks to Allah. Okay? That's what I'm asking for when I'm asking for Allah to put me on the path of His favors. Now the second description is not the path of anger, not of those on whom is anger. And most of the translations will often say, not the path of your anger, Allah. Okay? But that's not part of the text. Okay. If I do not see my life as favors, if I look at my life and say, look, oh Allah, I'm working so hard, you don't give me anything, but that person doesn't do anything, and Allah gives them everything. Okay? We, you know, we call it jealousy. That's the path of anger. If I look at my life as favors, then that's the path of gratitude. If I look at my life as having no favors, then that's the path of anger. And if I respond to Allah's favors with anger, then what response would I get from Allah? Perhaps the anger of Allah. So, the path of Allah's favors, not the path of, of anger. And then there are those people who are astray who are just completely lost. So that is, in one simple sense, the basic goal of Al-Fatiha. Gratitude to Allah versus anger. 
that one will win over the other. Either anger will win over gratitude, or gratitude will win over anger. And think about it. Think about how wealthy our Muslim community is. Think about how wealthy our American society is. Think about how much anger we have. That's a problem. If you think about how much anger we have, just simply in American society, uh, including us, uh, that's a serious problem. And so from there, I gave you two assignments. One assignment was every single time, uh, read through the Quran, read through the translation that we gave you, uh, uh, 20 ayahs a day, every single time you see mention of Allah, underline it. Whether it's Allah or an attribute of Allah or a pronoun, he or we, uh, underline it. And do that 20 ayahs a day. And if you've been doing it, inshallah, please continue to do so. When August begins, when Ramadan begins, increase it. And if you continue doing it, let's say 30 ayahs a day, then when September comes, increase it to 40 ayahs a day. And part of the point of the exercise is that it's guiding you to focus on Allah and the Quran. Because what we've been conditioned for in our community is to look, okay, what is it telling me to do? Okay, I have to do this and this and this and this, and then we're done and we close the book. Right? But as we said, most of the Quran does not give you instructions. Only about 5% of the Quran is instructions. Maybe even 3%, maybe 8%, depending on who you ask. 90% of the Quran focuses on how you think. How you think both with your mind as well as with your heart. And the other uh, assignment was to look at mercies in your life, to spend a little bit of moment in your day, preferably with a notebook, and list mercies that are in your life. Maybe even mercies in that day. And when you think of those mercies, say from within, Alhamdulillah. This is conditioning. As you keep doing this, you are conditioning yourself to see your life as mercies. Or something. And then that leads us into Al-Baqarah. Now in Al-Baqarah, the first question would relate to the names of the surahs. Al-Fatiha, I said that our translations often say that's the opening, but more accurately it's the opener. Al-Fatiha is the opener. It opens up the whole surah for us, or the whole, the whole Quran for us. It opens up every passage for us. Now Al-Baqarah, Adi, Ali Imran, Al-Nisa, where do these names come from? Many of the names come from the Prophet, peace be upon him, himself. But what is the main function? The main function is identification. Meaning Al-Baqarah may give us a summary of the contents of Al-Baqarah, maybe not. Some people connect with connect this with Ayah 67 through 71, uh, this story where Musa alayhi salam uh, told his people to slaughter a cow. Uh, but anytime I mention Surah Al-Baqarah, everybody knows what Surah I'm talking about. The main function is identification. And likewise, if I say Surah An-Nas, Surah Al-Falaq, Another way that we would know surahs is by the first the first ayahs. If I say, okay, tell me uh, about surah Qul A'udhu Bi Rabbin Nas, okay, you know what surah I'm talking about. So these are methods of identification. But this leads us into Al-Fatiha, or not Al-Fatiha, Alif Lam Mim. That the first ayah of Alif Lam, uh, first ayah of Al-Baqarah is Alif Lam Mim. And we all pronounce it this way. Why? Well, the book says so, but if I don't know the rules of Tajweed, I see this madda and this other madda, I wouldn't know that this is pronounced as Alif Lam Mim. I might pronounce it as Alama. Okay. Or if I don't even know that much, I might pronounce this as Alima. What is Alima? Azabun Alim. Pain. Right? I might pronounce this as, as a word that is not even, uh, that is way off. I might pronounce this as pain. So how do we know this? One central aspect of our tradition is, is this living tradition. The term we use in the tradition, silsila or isnad. This tradition that is handed off from person to person to person, from across the whole generations. And the example we gave is when someone learns how to do salah. You might learn how to do salah from a book, you might learn it from a website, but when do you really learn how to do salah? When you're praying with other people. But most often you will learn salah from someone else who learn from someone else, who learn from someone else, who learn from someone else, going back 1,400 years. And this, I think, is one of the, the, uh, the miracles of the tradition that I think we, we take for granted, that everyone is learning Salah this way. You're learning from someone else who's learning from someone else, and you go to Hajj and everybody prays almost exactly the same way, right? The problem is when you are raised in our community, we only see the differences, okay? You lift up your hands, do not lift up your hands, put your finger up, don't put your finger up, right? Missing the point that the other 95% of the Salah is identical. Yeah. 
And this is all across the globe. So somebody living in some desert in some other part of the world is learning the exact same way we are. And then you come to Hajj and everybody prays the same way. I think that's, that's, a, that's really, really amazing. But this is a big aspect of our tradition that our tradition has handed off from person to person to person. What else? Um, uh, other points that we've made about about uh, Alif Lam Mim. So often, if you ask someone about Alif Lam Mim, they'll tell you the same answer. Okay, we don't know what this means. Allah knows what this means. Okay, that's all correct. We all agree. This is all true for every single other ayah in the Quran. Okay, ultimately, Allah knows what what it means. But one of the methods of learning from the Quran. One of the methods of tafsir of the Qur'an is to look at the Qur'an itself, using the Qur'an to explain the Qur'an. Now, when I open up Al-Baqarah, I see the next ayah is, this is the book, No Doubt, Guidance for Those Who Have Taqwa. When I turn to the next surah, Ali Ibran, Alif Lam Mim, and then Allah, Allah is uh, the living, the eternal, and then Allah is the one who sent down the book, confirming uh, the, 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 or he's the one who revealed the books before it, and confirming with this confirms the truth of those books. He's talking about the book again. Okay. If we look at Surah Yusuf, Alif Lam Ra, then again Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala after that speaks about the book. If we look at Surah Maryam, Surah 19, Kaf Ha Ya Ain Saad, and then we have the communication between Zakaria and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What is the point here? That we see something consistent. Every time a surah begins with these letters, almost right after that, there's a communication. Yeah, it discusses some sort of communication between Allah and creation. So there's some consistent pattern here. So maybe we can learn from that that the starting point of education is letters, is words, is communication. Or that's the starting point of connecting to Allah. Allah knows best, but we see some consistent pattern. But what is important in terms of our practice? If I am saying, I don't know what this means, but Allah knows what this means. What have I just done? I've intellectually submitted. I'm saying, I don't know what this means, but Allah knows what this means. I have said, my world of knowledge is limited, and there's a world beyond that. That's submission. So we have two steps now in submission to Allah. One is we made dua, guide us to the straight path. And the second is we've begun to submit. Now, this book, no doubt, in it, it is guidance for those who have taqwa. Uh, a small point, at least some of these slides are very, are very messy, that's my fault. Uh, when we look at the Arabic, it says, al kitabu la raib. Then fihi, and before fihi we see three dots, after fihi we see three dots, hudalil okay. And we said that this, uh, this uh, we learned this in terms of the Tajweed rules, that what is this punctuation? You stop at one or you stop at the other. And what does that mean? That we have two sentences in this ayah simultaneously. One is, this is the book, uh, this is the book, there is no doubt in it. It is guidance for those who have taqwa. So the book has no doubt in it, and the book is itself guidance. The other is, this is the book, no doubt, no doubt about the book, in it is guidance for those who have taqwa. Small point, but significant, that the book is doubtless, and the contents of the book is doubtless. Again, I met a person 15 years ago in the, in the far south suburbs who became Muslim because of this ayah. Okay. Because this book is claiming categorically, okay, there's no doubt about it. Now think about this, uh, you know, I teach in the liberal arts. One of the ideas of the liberal arts is that, okay, there's no more absolute truth. You have your truth, I have, you have your truth, I have my truth. And that's that, don't bother me, I don't bother you. Right? This is essentially you know, a, recurring, a recurring theme even though nobody, nobody practices it. Okay. Here we're saying, no, there is an absolute truth. There is an absolutely an absolute truth, which means there's definitely falsehood also. But what about the word kitab, which is almost always translated as book? How else did we translate kitab? Does anybody remember? Because at the time of the Prophet, peace be upon him, the, book, uh, the Quran was not in book form. When was it put into book form? Okay, we're often taught Osman al Islam was taught under Abu Bakr. It was put on, under Abu Bakr. Right? That uh, uh, during the Ridda Wars, uh, many of the uh, many of the of the Hafaz, many of the people who had the Quran memorized, began to die. And Omar said to, to Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with them both, we need to put the Quran into book form because if these people all die, the Quran will be gone. 
And Abu Bakr's response was the classic response of the Sahaba. Yeah. He said, how can I do something that the, the, the Prophet peace upon him didn't do? Right? I mean, that is, that is what we think of when we think of the Sahaba. And then Omar convinced him, and they decided to do it. This was a bid'ah, right? Everyone likes to use the bid'ah, the, the hammer of bid'ah. This is a bid'ah. This is a good innovation. They put the Quran into book form because the Prophet peace upon him did not do that. This was completed by the time Abu Bakr died, which was two years after the death of the Prophet, peace be upon him. Under Uthman, may Allah be pleased with him, they standardized the script. So, what else does kitab mean? It means prescription. Kutiba alaykum al-siyam. Kutiba alaykum al-kitab. Written for you, prescribed for you, is siyam. Written to you, prescribed for you, is fighting. That's a different class. But this is the prescription, no doubt, in it is guidance for those who have taqwa. The other big word in this in this ayah that we have to translate properly is taqwa. Taqwa is often translated these days as fear, okay? as fear of God. There are other words that speak of fear. Right? Uh, taqwa is shield. Right? We are taking Allah as a shield. Okay? What does that mean? That whatever happens to me in dunya, whatever happens to me in this world, whatever people throw at my way. Allah is my shield. Alhamdulillah. So this is guidance for those who have taqwa. And then the question is, well, what if I do not have taqwa? Okay. It says it's guidance for those who have taqwa. So if I do not have taqwa, what do we see? There's two levels of guidance here. Number one, how to get taqwa. So for example, we saw in the same surah, ayah 21, Ya ayyuhan nasu abudu rabbakum. So, O oh mankind, be the abd of your Rabb. He created you as He created those before you. La'allakum tattakun. So that you may get taqwa. In ayah 63, Allah speaking to Bani Israel, saying, Hold tight to what, what Allah has given them. You remember what is in it, so that you may get taqwa. Fasting. We call, why do we call Ramadan the month of fasting, the month of taqwa? Because the ayah uh, on, on fasting, Ya ayyuhan, ya ayyuhan ladhina amanu, Kutiba alaykum as O you who believe, fasting is prescribed for you as it was prescribed for those before you. So that you may get taqwa. So, one level of guidance of the Quran is how to get taqwa. And as I'm getting taqwa, the actual, number B, the actual guidance for those who have taqwa. Same words, different level of guidance. So, then we saw in ayah 2 through 5 attributes of those people who have taqwa. Number one, they believe in the unseen. Number two, they establish salah. Number three, they give or they spend of what Allah has bestowed upon them. Then four and five, they believe in the revelation sent down to the Prophet, peace be upon him, the revelation sent before him. And number six, they are certain of the hereafter. Now, what is common among all of these attributes? We said common among all these attributes is that these are people who have trust. These are people who trust Allah, that the people of taqwa have trust in Allah. Okay. This gets important because in a moment we're going to look at the people of Nifaq, the hypocrites. What is their central uh, common trait? They distrust Allah. The people, of, uh, the people of Taqwa trust Allah. They know Allah will take care of them. The hypocrites distrust Allah, meaning they either believe that Allah is not going to take care of them or they believe Allah is going to make their life more difficult. What else do we say? All of these are very much like Alif Lam Mim. When I believe in the unseen, I'm saying there's a world that I can see, that I can hear, that I can touch, and then there's a world beyond that. So just like Alif Lam Mim, there's my knowledge, and there's knowledge beyond that. What else is in the unseen? What is in the unseen? Is that Allah is in the unseen? Jinns are in the unseen? Angels are in the unseen? The future is in the unseen. Okay. What else is in the unseen? History is in the unseen. The story of Yusuf, Yusuf alayhi salam, the Prophet peace be upon him was not there. And Allah tells him at the end of that surah, you were not there when this happened, this is from the unseen. Think about this when we read a history book. I'm trusting that what is in this history book is actually what happened. And you especially see this if you, if you look at, at you know, a topic where there's a, you know, a hot button issue. You know, if, we, if I look at the history of Palestine, if I look at the history of Israel, I'm going to see two completely different histories. I'm going to trust one and not the other. This other person is going to trust this one and not that one. Right? It's a matter of trust. History is part of, of, of trust. They establish Salah. 
Now, how do we define this? Number one, that it becomes part of your normal practice. Right? Breakfast, lunch, dinner, five daily prayers, it's part of your normal practice. We also said at a societal level, this might be part of the routine of society. Okay? Sunday, you have a lot of people who go to church, a lot of people who go watch football, okay? that's part of the routine of Sunday. Monday, the routine for most people is you have rush hour, you know, 7 a.m. to 10, 10, 9 a.m. You have the uh, work day, you have a break, you have more work, you have lunch, so forth and so on. Rush hour, going home, you have prime time. So you are ongoing in this process of establishing that. But the next one, infak. How do we define infak? Because we uh, this is often translated as a give of what Allah has bestowed upon them. What is infak? Anybody remember? Raise your hand. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. You are giving to the point of exhaustion. That the people of Taqwa, they don't just give charity. This is not just zakah. They are giving to the point of exhaustion. They give and they give and they give and they give. And in the Quran, what does it speak of giving? Your wealth and your soul. Right? Your wealth, all the different types of wealth you have, and your time. You give and you give give to the point of, of exhaustion. Now in terms of belief in the previous revelations, number five, uh, we did this is, uh, for most of us, this is very, very basic, that we believe in all the revelations that Allah sent out. We also believe that all the revelations that Allah sent out have the same core message, la ilaha illallah, in the different languages. The content beyond that might vary. The sharia of Musa, alayhi salam, is different than the sharia, uh, the sharia of Muhammad, is upon him. But all of them in their original form, we believe in all of them. But we also believe that these books have been lost or tampered or changed. The Quran has been preserved. The last attribute of those who have taqwa is that they're certain of the hereafter. Now, here, part of our discussion was, I asked you, think of anything and everything that you are certain of, that you are absolutely positive of. One thing is that you're going to die. We're all certain we're going to die. If we have a certain level of faith, we might say that we are certain in uh, belief in Allah, we are certain about Akhirah and so forth and so on. But at the very least, we're all certain we're going to die. Okay. And think about that also. Uh, how would it affect your behavior if your doctor told you that, okay, according to all of our measurements, you're going to die on Sunday? Okay. How would that affect your conduct? Okay. You have four days left, two days left. Yeah. yeah. But this, I mean, this is what we all tell ourselves, right? This is what we say at the Jum'ah, okay, okay, pray as, as though this is your last prayer. I mean, we, we say it so many times that it begins to lose its meaning. Yeah. It's not told by the doctor, though. Yeah, yeah. 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 yeah, the doctor says, pray as though it's your last prayer, unless you still have outstanding bills. Give everybody an ask for Sorry? Do you know what time? Forgive everybody. And so you forgive everyone. And ask forgiveness from everyone. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That we can do even now. <laughs> Sorry? I said that we can do even yeah. now when we start fresh. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you, you really see this consciousness when people are going on hudge. Because yeah. then suddenly yeah. everyone starts forgiving, yeah. everyone is hugging each other, and you go on hudge and everybody starts yelling at each other. Okay, Iman. Iman, we commonly translate this as faith. But what does Iman literally mean? It means you have such a level of security that people around you feel secure. This is Iman. That if I have Iman, I feel so secure that the people around me feel secure. So it's as though Iman security is radiating from me out to others. This is Iman. And then in Ayah 5, okay. These people have guidance and these people are successful. And how do we define success? Is it success in the Akhirah? Definitely. Success also in the dunya. And what is the success of the person of taqwa? One is that they're content. They are happy. They are pleased. Pleased with Allah. They know they, they can keep improving. Uh, what is another, uh, another of the successes? You understand how everything works. You understand what is important, what is not important. One of the one of the uh, one of the joys of aging Hello? is that when you're young, you worry about everything. You don't know what you're supposed to worry about, what you're not supposed to worry about. As you get older and older, you realize okay, all those things I worried about, I don't need to worry about anymore. But part of 
taqwa is that you understand, I don't need to worry about these things, but I do need to worry about these things. Then we get to Aya 6 and Aya 7. Okay. What have we seen? One model of belief is the person of taqwa. The second model of belief is the kafir. Okay, how did we define kafir? Because I have this big note, kafir is not the same as non-Muslim. And if I can remember, what is a kafir? What makes somebody a kafir? Yeah. So they feel compelled to turn to Allah. Something is making them inside turn to, to turn to Allah, and they reject it. They suppress it. That's what makes somebody a kafir. Not the same as non-Muslim. A kafir is someone who feels compelled to turn to Allah, and they reject it. You know, in my other class, uh, we, uh, we made a very interesting point. Uh, at the time of the Prophet, peace be upon him, there was uh, this, this poetry competition. You know, we all know that they were poets. And the Prophet, peace be upon him, entered, he gave them Surat al-Kawthar. Inna atina al And it wins the competition. They put, they hang this in the Kaaba. And underneath they write, could not have been written by a man. And still they remain coffers. They're going that far. They're recognizing how amazing the Quran is. Abu Jahal, who the Prophet, peace be upon him, regarded as the pharaoh of his time. And he used to sit outside the Prophet's house, peace be upon him, listening to him recite the Quran. Abu Sufyan, who alhamdulillah became Muslim, used to listen to the Prophet, peace be upon him, recite the Quran at night. So think about this. Kafir is not the same as non-Muslim. Kafir is recognizing the truth of Allah and is rejecting it. A non-Muslim might be ignorant, might be a jahid. Okay. So Kafir is someone who has rejected it. And in this ayah, it's past tense. Inna ladina kafaru, this is past tense. Someone who has rejected it. It's all the same to them. If you warn them or do not warn them, they will not believe. And we raised the point about the fitrah, that in our belief, everyone is born on fitrah. We have a hadith that says everyone is born on fitrah, and their parents make them Jewish, Christian, Magian, Jews, Zoroastrian, so forth and so on. There are a few elements of the fitrah. We believe that everyone is born with some sort of consciousness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that you're born with it. It's part of your wiring. We believe that everyone is born with a consciousness of right or wrong, right? When you have a baby, when you have a little kid, a little kid knows especially when, when they're doing something wrong, you know, when they're crossing a boundary. Because you know? that's when they really start behaving, they get quiet, right? You know? <laughs> now I have, I have Allah's phone. You know? They have a consciousness of, of, of right and wrong. But this pure fitrah can get corrupted. But can also be repurified. This is different in our society, I mean, our greater American society, one common view is you're born blank, you know nothing, you have nothing. But I had a student this past year who, who was a, a, a child psychologist, and she disagrees. She says everybody is born with something. Right? She says you can see it, there's, there's too much data to say that you're not, that you're born. Even the way you walk, right? You know, a lot of it is something more than just genetics. So we see in IS 6 they rejected. Okay? As for those who have rejected, whether you warn them or do not warn them, they will not believe. Ayah 7, Allah seals them off. And the question that we raise is, which is causing which? Now, for our purposes, you know, I, have, I make my choices, Allah judges me. But part of the reason I raise this question is because this is the question that hits college students the hardest. Or one of the questions that hits college students the hardest. How can you have free will if Allah knows everything? If Allah already knows what I'm going to do, then I don't have choice. Because we take it further, we say Allah makes everything happen. He's Rabb, Rabb of all the worlds. And for our purposes, just keeping it simple, we're saying that they are both true. That you have free will and Allah controls everything. That you have free will and Allah uh, also judges you accordingly. And from the perspective of me having freedom to make my choices, the day of judgment is a day of justice. But looking at everything from the perspective that Allah controls everything, the day of judgment is what? But Allah is deciding who goes to heaven, who goes to hell. Now, ayah 8 through 16, we'll look at this and then we'll stop for, for Salat al-Asr. 
We have the third model. What do we have at the beginning of the Sutta? We have three models. The person of taqwa, the kafir, and the person of nifaq, hypocrisy, the munafiq, Ayah 8 through 16. Okay, now the first point, this word munafiq, that we define uh, commonly as hypocrite. We said this is related to the word for tunnel, nafaq. Okay? And what is a tunnel? A tunnel is this, this tube that has an opening at one end and an opening at the other end. And there was a wizard that lived in the desert, probably still does, that would live in a tunnel in the desert. And if a predator came from one end, the lizard could escape out the other end. Another word was related to this, this uh, a certain type of fort that if the army was coming from one side, there was always a back door you could escape out of. And a hypocrite is very much like this. A hypocrite is always looking for a way to escape. And we see four attributes of hypocrites here. Ayah 8 through 10, they keep lying. They lie, they lie, they lie. Ayah 11 to 12, anytime someone gives them criticism, they ignore it. Ayah, uh, it should be Ayah 13, they're also arrogant. They're told, believe as the people believe. They say, shall we believe as the fools believe? And then Ayah 14 and 15, here it said that the word is two-faced. Here, with believers they behave one way, with shaitans they behave a different way. But what is common among all of these? They distrust Allah. Why does somebody tell a lie? Okay. Maybe I would tell a lie, A'udhu Billah, because I want someone to be pleased with me. Maybe I'll lie on my resume so I get a higher pay. Okay. Maybe I'm lying so I don't get in trouble. Okay. Teacher says, did you do your homework? Yes, I did, but you know, my, my, my dog ate it, right? Yeah, like you're Muslim, you don't have a dog. But the, the point is that we might uh, lie so we want someone's pleasure, or we <coughs> lie because we want uh, to avoid punishment. But the question that I raised was, in that time, am I committing shirk? Because the time I'm lying, I'm saying this person's reward is more important to me than Allah's reward. Because if Allah's reward was more important, then I would speak the truth, even if it hurts. Okay? And we said it sounds like shirk, but don't call something shirk unless Allah calls it shirk. Okay? Shirk is like kafir. Shirk is another one of those huge words you don't want to start giving to everything. Okay? That's very, very irresponsible that a lot of people do. This is shirk, this is shirk, this is shirk. Uh, if Allah doesn't call it shirk, don't call it shirk. The point about deflecting criticism. They are told, do not make mischief. They say, no, no, we're only making peace. We're only reforming. Okay. And what is our lesson here? If someone gives you criticism, consider the criticism. You don't have to agree. You don't have to follow it. But consider it. And it may be, in that moment, maybe Allah is giving you a hint. Okay. Whether it's Somebody who seems very pious, or somebody who seems to have, have no, no morals, no manners. If someone's giving you criticism, consider it. Even if it's just for a few moments, consider it. Now think about it. If my biggest concern is to win the pleasure of Allah, then my goal is to find, okay, what are all the things that I'm doing wrong? Okay. And maybe I don't realize I'm doing this wrong and that wrong until somebody gives me the criticism. So criticism's not easy to take. Mm -hmm. But consider it. Obviously, arrogance, we have to be humble. Okay. And here, when they're told to believe as the people believe, they say, we, should we believe as the fools believe? What is our basic lesson here, our simple lesson? We should value everybody. Okay. Value the people who, who believe your way. Value the people who believe a different way. Value the people who don't have belief at all. Value everyone. Okay. That is a step towards being humble. Now, regarding being two-faced, these people, when they're with the believers, they say, we believe. When they're with their shaitans, when they are with their shaitans, they say, we're really with you, we're making fun of them. The question I raised was, when I'm standing before you, I behave one way. Okay. When I'm in privacy with, with my daughters, with my family, they see much more of my personality. They see me angry, they see me upset, they see me afraid. Right? When I'm alone, that's the whole person. How is this different? Every time I'm with you, or with my daughters, or you know, with, or by myself, it's still the same person. I'm just showing different amounts of my personality. Okay? What we're describing here in point number four, this is a person who behaves this way here in a complete contradiction over there. 
because they are trying to win everyone else's pleasure. They're trying to make everyone else happy. What is a person of taqwa doing? He's trying to make Allah happy. What is a hypocrite doing? Trying to make others happy at the cost, at the expense of making Allah happy. So, a lot of times we have to choose one or the other. The person of taqwa chooses to make Allah happy. The person of hypocrisy chooses to make other people happy. Usually it's the same thing. What you do to make others happy will also make Allah happy. Usually that's the case. Except in wrongdoing. The other key point is that there's two types of hypocrites. Those who are consciously hypocrites and those who are hypocrites in terms of their actions. The first one is nifaq fil aqidah. The second one is nifaq fil amal. And the key point here is that there are some people who are intentionally fake. In our society today, we call them moles, like an FBI mole, an informant. They're pretending to be believers, but that's not their intention. Their intention is to, to mislead. But the concern for most of us is the second one, that I might be a hypocrite by virtue. My actions show that I'm a hypocrite. That... Uh, there are many, many uh, narrations of, of hypocrites in the Qur'an, maybe 30, maybe more. There are many hadith about, about hypocrisy. Uh, the most famous one might be the, the, the hadith. The, the Prophet peace on him, said there's three or there's four uh, signs of a hypocrite. If you have one of them, you're that much. If you have all of them, you're, you're a full hypocrite. When you speak, you lie. When you make a commitment, you break your commitment. When someone trusts you with something, you break your trust. Right? Someone tells you, okay, don't tell anyone about this, and then you tell everyone. And when you get emotional, you lose complete control of your emotions. This is the hypocrisy we have to be concerned about. Okay? That uh, I might be a hypocrite, I might not realize it. We have another teaching. A true believer believes that he or she is a hypocrite. But a true hypocrite <laughs> believes that he or she is a true believer. Okay? Think about it. A believer sees all of the flaws. I know all these flaws. I do this wrong, I do this wrong, I do this wrong. Everyone else thinks I'm a great believer, but I know I do this, and I know I do this, and I know I do this, and I know I do this. I'm a fraud, right? But the hypocrite thinks, wow, Allah is so pleased with me. Look at all these great things that I do. You know, I just donated one dollar to this Muslim organization. This is uh, the point is that we have to be very cautious about being hypocrites. And another lesson is that if I'm introducing Islam to an audience, I'm going to talk about happy things, happy, happy, happy. Allah, introducing Islam, speaks about happy things in Al-Fatiha, speaks about happy things in speaking about Taqwa, and then very unhappy things in speaking about Kafirs and Munafiks. What is one of our lessons here? That this material is very serious. Right? We're talking about how you live your life and what comes after. There's no more topic that is more serious than this. And so, that is the lesson thus far. Uh, and, and in fact, I'm sorry, the last point about, about hypocrites, this gets summed up in Ayah, in Ayah 16, is simply that life is all a matter of choices. And all day long, you and I have been making choices. What time do I get up? What do I wear? What do I do after I get up? What do I do next? What do I do next? What do I do next? Big choices, small choices. And the key of a hypocrite is sometimes you have to choose between right and wrong, and the hypocrite chooses wrong. Why? Because they think that's going to give them a better result. Believer chooses right, even though that might be the, the, the tougher path. But it's all about choices. And the promise is that if you take the wrong choice, you're losing guidance, and the benefit you think you're going to have is not going to be very much. Okay. Uh, let us take a break for, for Salat Asaf, and then we will continue along in our high-speed intensive study. Uh, and then for those who are watching online, uh, at the end of class, we will do our exciting raffle for the iPod 2. And so we'll take our break. Whoever has not joined the raffle, you can join the raffle. And also do will do. Thank you.